Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, special discipleship train training that um, we've been having the past three weeks. This is the last um, on a four part series on dealing with eternal pain. Um, we have covered a lot and looking at internal pain and um, we have looked at the source and we have looked at some of the consequences of uh, internal pain and um, in other words we've been able to trace we've been able to face and we are right now at the point at the stage where we are now facing it and um, i want to encourage you to look at the other three parts that we have already had on this series and uh, on this we are bringing it all together now because we're looking at steps to overcome internal pain and uh, here are fundamental scriptures that guides us here because the word of god is the foundation um in first john chapter 5 verse 4 it says, for whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Everyone that is born of God, every child of God is an overcomer. In other words, you are not defeated. You are an overcomer. Two other uh, translations uh, even bring it, make it more clearer. It says every child of God can defeat the world. And our faith is what gives us that victory. Every child of God. It, it is a some child of God. If you're a child of God, victory is yours. Another translation tells us, it says, because everyone who is a child of God has the power to win against the world. Wow. What a truth. And based on these facts, we are looking at steps to overcome. And as you can see on this diagram, um, these are two ladders that uh, are available, that are out there for people to use to address issues in their lives. Um, the ladder on my left hand side, you know, you can see has only three runs to climb out of this pit. And those three runs are repent, you know, pray and uh, attend the church. So any of these are the things that uh, the religion has offered us. You know, if you've been around the church over your lifetime, you will find that these are how churches dealt with uh, issues in people's life. But we are talking about something that is deeper than just a surface thing. And uh, I've seen people that got saved and they born again, they feel with the Holy Spirit. You know, they've got every uh, box ticked when it comes to religious and the church things, but internally they carry this excruciating pain, life dominating pain, emotional pains that they don't know what to do about it as a result of what has happened in their lives. And this, continue to manifest themselves in different ways as we look at some of the consequences. Um, you, people are not living the abundant life. Jesus promised us an abundant life. Um, abundant life is not a dream. It's something that has been perfectly uh, worked for, provided for, paid for by Jesus Christ. So we repent you know, we, we celebrate our salvation, we're going to heaven, but here on earth, we are living in hell as a result of uh, undealt issues that we have been through in life. These things have really stifled our joy. No wonder many people start very well, you know, to, to be Christians, but after a while, you don't see them. You look at your shoulder, over your shoulder in the church, you don't see them anymore. And when you call them, they, they don't sound happy. They don't sound joyfully. It, it flow through relationship 
uh, it flowed through marriage relationship, it flowed through every areas of our lives. Internal pain is a killer, it's very deadly. And uh, until it is properly diagnosed, until it's properly looked at, and uh, over these uh, past weeks, we've been able to do what I call tracing, and we've been able to face. And now on this uh, particular point, we're going to do what I call the, you know, we, when we trace and face, we replace it. And the replacing part of it is where we now come uh, face to face with reality and the truth as to what actually is happening in our lives. So uh, repent, pray, and attend church as a prescription is not good enough. As you can see, it has only three runs on the ladder. And the, to go from one to another, is, it, it, it can tear you apart. But on the re, uh, right hand side, we have a more specific uh, uh, directed intentional uh, uh, steps, how to get out of the mess, uh, how to get out of the uh, uh, these uh, situations that has remained for such a long time. Remember, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. He came to give us peace. He came to restore and, and uh, reclaim our lives. He's done it. He didn't just patch us up. He replaced our life with his life. Now, these steps we are going to look at in closely so as to understand how to really overcome over the uh, over time we've also looked at these uh, uh, learning circles which has been a really amazing you've seen that we use this uh on this discipleship training a lot this uh, learning circle or what we call kairos moment is pretty much like the 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 diagram i have put up there where they, uh, you, you, you know, we got to observe, reflect, discuss, as well as plan, partner, and act on what God is doing and saying in our lives. So the Kairos moment of God, is, you know, is, is different. We humans, we have two uh, uh, time conscious or time understanding. We know of the Kronos time, and also we know of the Kairos the chronos is where we measure, uh, uh, you know, by minutes, seconds, and minutes, and days, and weeks, and months, and years. Uh, that's chronological, chronos timing. While on the other hand, we have the kairos timing. Kairos is a momentary thing. It, it can happen in a moment. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, we, we had... Jesus saying the time has come. The time has come. Repent and believe the gospel. Amazing. It is an encounter. The, 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 if you look inside the big circle, you see two, it's divided in equal part. The one part talks about repent. In other words, what is God saying to me? The belief side is saying, how will I obey God? Now, this is what Kairos a moment does in our lives. It confronts us with reality. That is when we observe what God is saying. What is happening to me? What exactly is God saying to me? And as we reflect it, what is my purpose? What is my, up, um, in, in reflection, we are saying, what is my upgrade? What can I do? What is this encounter? going to result what is going to come out of this from me okay we discuss it and we share we look at uh ways because if you don't talk about something we don't just pretend that things are not happening a lot of people prefer to sweep things under the carpet they just internalize it there and that is why it is a problem that's why it it grew to cause pain in your life. That's why the name internal pain comes from. And it becomes pain, internal painful because for some reason it's not talked about. You don't discuss it. You just kept it onto yourself. And then all the symptoms are all over your lives. It should not be. 
as we believe what God is saying to us under the belief section, that actually is where the action that we produce a result takes place. We, are, we plan, we partner, and then we act upon it. So I'm bringing this because you'll be seeing this through our presentations and through our teachings and ministries. Each time you see, you can understand that these two actually complement very well on, on what we are teaching. So number one, steps on this uh, uh, la uh, ladder, we are looking at the, the very, on the basis of the ladder, step one for us to crawl, you know, to, to come out of this pit is we have to locate the source or the original trauma that has caused, that is causing this pain in us. It is very, very important because we don't try to bury feelings that are still much alive or try to suppress it just because it hurts so much. And this is what a lot of people do. You know, you have a saw, when you try to poke your finger in the saw, it hurts and then you avoid, you say, no, no, don't touch it. Don't touch it. The more you leave the pain, the more you leave the original trauma, the more you don't want to talk about it, the more it causes pain. It doesn't matter how old you are. The older we become, the more painful it becomes. It affects our relationship. It affects our marriage. It affects how we deal with our kids, how we deal with our children. Even it can flow over to workplace relationship where there is such a conflict, unending conflict. And most of the time we are looking to those conflicts as coming from outside instead of allowing ourselves to look at inside what are those feelings that we have buried what are those things that has happened in our lives in the past which we did not properly understand or dealt with but they are resulting into this excruciating heart on daily basis so it is important to locate the source as well as the original trauma. So it, and it's not resolved until it no longer stinks. You get that? It's not resolved until it no longer stinks. And drawing, uh, drowning the pain with alcohol or drink or work is not a way to long time healing either. A lot of people uses all kinds of things to mask the pain. It's like putting a bandage or a plaster over a wound. That might cover the surface, but internally we are still hurting. So I'm saying here that it's not resolved. If there are issues or things you've been through in life that are still, each time it sticks you, you know, it still pricks your heart, it's still a problem then it hasn't been dealt with properly. We need to be addressed. And until that happens, yo, the problem will continue to persist. Now, the willingness to examine your beliefs as well as replace those found to be causing you trouble and pain. This is at the base of getting out of the situation. You must be willing to examine beliefs. In other words, what belief is actually fueling this situation? Why it's, you know, and if, if you're holding those beliefs there to you, those pain will continue to persist, okay? So steps number two, as we come out of, you know, we, this is progressive. We move from uh, 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 the ladder round one, we are now in two. It talks about accepting responsibility for choices. Accepting responsibility for choices. We can look at that as um, coming off this uh, defensive completely in your thinking. What's 
as well as actions, you come out defensive. Because why one of the misbelief is the way you have interpreted, the way you have con come into conclusions as to what has happened to you. Each time you keep defending the situation without looking critically from the truth base, that will persist. The second thing there is take your pride and self esteem out of others' hand. You don't take everything so personally, especially when you look, when, uh, if you're the type that always see yourself from how people sees you, wow, that is going to be uh, a problem. Because if your self-esteem is in the hand of people, it is what mom said or what dad says or what your husband or your wife what people out there are telling you about yourself and you believe them, this is not taking responsible for your choices, okay? So right now, you got to take it off their hand. You take it, it, it becomes your personal responsibility. And that is, and we're going to understand it a bit more as we go down because the, your self-worth your pride is not based on what others are saying about you. It comes down to what is your dad, your heavenly father saying about you. That is what is important for your life. Now, accept responsibility for your own responses as well as choice is the first step to a healed life. Become responsible for your responses. How do you respond? We have seen in the past uh, uh, in teachings or the past sessions, how we either react or we respond. Responding to the situation is far more better. And we are responding because we are coming from informed, uh, uh, um, we, we've got knowledge, we've got insights, we've got understanding as to what we are going through, and we begin to respond to that. And the response, instead of reacting, hastening for the healing, actually helps us to get healed faster and quicker than, you know, allowing things to just linger. Step number three talks about collecting insights on topics, in other words, knowing the truth. What is the truth about what has happened to me or about what I am going through? Jesus made it clear. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What sets free is the truth. What sets free is the truth. And what will uh, keep people in perpetual darkness is lies. If I'm believing lies over my situation, that will not bring healing. It actually will aggravate the problem. Okay. So look at uh, this point. I say, yeah, when you understand how you can live out of the mind of Christ permanently, you will have taught your mind how to comfort as well as look after you. Do you know you can teach your mind how to look after yourself? You can teach your mind how to comfort you instead of how to upset you. The mind of Christ, every believer, the Bible tells us we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is, has come to be our mind, has come to be my mind. And I have to taught my mind. I have to taught myself that. And in teaching myself, my mind is no more my enemy. My mind is no more attacking me. My mind is no more undermining my well-being. 
my mind each time will agree with truth that helps me to live a better life, an overcoming life, a life of victory. So when you understand how you can live out of the mind of Christ, this is our calling. We are called Project uh, um, uh, Atmosphere 12.2. Atmosphere 12.2 means uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that says, you know, I beseech you by the mercy of God, you know, do not... Uh, uh, but he said, bring your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. He said, do not conform to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this renewal comes with truth. As we uh, keep, get learning the truth of Jesus, our minds are renewed. And we begin to teach our mind to defend us. We begin to teach our mind to comfort us and not to upset us. You know, those emotional pain are all acted out in the mind. The, the mind is the resident of them, the emotional seat of our life. These are where the pains are felt so deeply. But when we taught our minds to comfort and look after us, not to condemn or undermine our well-beings, it is very, very important. So let the pain from your past trauma motivate you to increase your insight in the present. Only then is the experience truly, truly transformed. How? Our brother Joseph. Joseph in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. When you think of it, what Joseph went through, how he was wanted to be killed by his brothers. They threw him inside this well. And from there, they took him out and they sold him to Egypt, Egyptian merchants. And uh, he ended up at Potiphar's house. And there, he was accused of uh, um, sexual molestation. And uh, of course, that led to him being imprisoned for life. Anyone that has gone through those process, if you've gone through that, you're going to live with what we call life-dominating anger. And you can justify it because he looked, over, he looked through what he's gone through. He found out that none of what he's been through are fault of his own. He's never done anything to warrant that. He's never done anything to merit that, to deserve that. We know I hear people say, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. That is absolutely truth. But you know what? Joseph learned. He allowed the pain from the past trauma motivate him to increase his insight in the present. In other words, he allowed the truth of God's you know, relationship with him. You know, I've asked myself over and over in the past, you know, said, who actually was Joseph's pastor? What church does Joseph attend? You see, it doesn't belong in playing religion. Relationship is not religion. All our old, uh, the people of the Old Testament, all the patriarchs, they had personal relationship. They dealt with their heavenly father. And they, he was present in their lives every day. The same thing with us today. If we understand this, we will never, you know, whatever pain or whatever thing that has happened to us becomes a learning process. Something that has, will lead to the transformations of our lives. Instead of them to stifle our lives, instead of them to cripple us, we actually grow and thrive out of those experiences. That is what it is. Number four expressing the pain as well as the catharsis. By that, I mean expression of repressed emotions. It's good to punch, it's good to sob, it's actually good to yell, to let the pressure off. You know, I've talked about what I went through as a, a little boy when we had the uh, conflict in Nigeria that led to three years 
uh, civil war between the Biafrans and the Nigerian federal government. And as a boy, I went through the, the war uh, around the age of eight, nine. And um, at the end of the war, I was captured by the military and I was taken away from our town, our village. And um, for the next six months, I was away in a far place, not knowing how I will ever get back to my parents. I was lost. And being away, after six months, one day, um, I don't know how it happened, but I, looking back, I see God. My mother started looking for me. She traced for me and was, she came to this, she passed two major cities to the third city. And uh, as she was, one day I was just coming out to go to the market and buy stuff. And in front of me was my mother. I saw my mother coming. She had no clue where she was going, except she told me that she prayed and said, God, help me look for my son. Even if it means I'm, I'll die, I don't mind. But anyway, when she saw me on the road and um, I saw her, it was my mother. I cried over her shoulder, she cried. And eventually we went home. You know, this happened almost uh, 19... 70, that's about 50 years ago. Now I'm writing a book about my experience during the war. And when I came to that point of, you know, meeting my mother, how she located me, I, this about two years ago, this actually happened to me here. And I started crying. I cried and I cried and I cried. And I thought that was over. I called on Ruben and to relate my experience after a few days. Again, over the phone, I was crying uncontrolled. I did not know, I did, I, I did not know how much built up that experience. Even though for years you know, I've been a, um, I've been ministering, I've been preaching, I've been, you know, counseling and uh, helping people, but never really dealt with that issue until that day. And after that experience, you know, whoa, I'm as free as anything. And I, I'm talking now, I have absolute no emotion. I have, I have no bad feeling, but if anything, I begin to appreciate what God did through my mother to come and brought me back and um, that, that was just an amazing thing that happened. So sometimes it's okay to talk about. It's okay to cry. It's okay to sob. You know, but if we don't let the pressure off, guess what? It's still there. And it has to be dealt with. So the ability to suffer short-term pain for the sake of gaining wisdom and insight, living skills, because everything we learn from what we've been through becomes a living skill for us. And that helps us not to be enslaved into avoiding or to find a quick fix over the situation. Can you imagine me avoiding not to talk about that civil war? You know, sometimes up until then, I didn't want to. And now I'm writing a book about it. I am actually addressing what happened and the effect on me was such um, a release to get to that point where I actually confront what happened to me as a little boy. Okay, so step number five. Step number five talk about committing to change. Commit to change. Commit to change means believe in as well as envision that I can change. This is really important. You know, I hear people most of the time saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, you can. You know, whenever we are saying, I can't, do you know exactly what you're saying? You actually meaning, I don't want to. I don't want to. But from scriptural point of view, Paul made us to understand that 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we believe we, when we believe in and also envision that I can change, I can get through this pain. This pain got to leave me. You know, I, I can come out of these situations or circumstances. Then victory is sure. You can. It is possible. Okay. So the ability to make friends with your past and to harness rather than avoid the resulting emotions. All of a sudden, the past are no more threatening, but they actually become friends. Joseph said that. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God has turned it around for good, as you can see today. Isn't that amazing? For me, I'm writing a book on Biafra, but more than just writing, I'm actually on the forefront of actualization. What we thought was a loss over 50 years ago, any moment from now, a new nation is gonna be born out of Nigeria called Biafra. And that is the, the positive thing that has come in. So whatever I went through was not in vain anymore but it has become a catalyst for me now to see something new happening in my own life and in my environment. So if you do, not, if you do what you've always done, you will get what you've always got. So where we do not commit to change, where we do not accept, you know, watch the steps we are going. This, this is amazing because and I want you to know that each of these steps, I, I'm giving a general overview of this, but we actually deal with people on individual basis. These are things we actually walk through with people over a period of time to gain uh, total freedom and total uh, uh, deliverance or forgiveness over what they've been through. I know to, to regain your, your, yourself for who you are and what God has made you to be. Steps number six talks about practical social, sorry, practice social skills. Practicing social skills talks about your ability to acknowledge your own emotions. Recognize emotions in others as well as use that information to guide your behavior. And this is really important because when you don't know yourself, you will hardly know of others. You will keep misjudging others, but by on acknowledging your own emotions and that position you to recognize the emotions of others. In other words, the ability to allow others the space to be responsible for their own feelings, their own emotions, and their reactions as well as choices. So it is very, very important. When you know that, you won't be responsible to other people's behavior, neither would they be responsible to your own behavior. Steps number seven, setting up goals, okay? And uh, this in turn, makes me remind you know, I says here, one of the best time we have here is studying the Wheel of Life series, which Pops Matthew has uh, brought to us. Now that has enabled us to set goals in every areas of our lives. There is a um, eight series on uh, Wheel of Life. If you have not, you know, been through that, I will encourage you. It's out there on our YouTube. The whole series are there because we look at the eight areas of our lives and each area we actually develop goals in how to, uh, those areas are, will be well catered for and well looked after. Yeah, so that, that is, that is a lot has already been said on that. And I want to recommend to you to go back to the Wheel of Life series because that's going to empower you the more. Steps number eight talks about mental health practices. This is very, very important because not many people understand their mental health practices, especially Christians. 
you know, the, what we know about our mental health is almost zero. We know so much about, you know, how we're going to go to heaven, but how to live a, a victorious life here, which affects our mental and emotional lives, many people don't know. So one of that is you have to understand the fundamentals in mental and emotional health. This is very, very important. I did share this uh, on the, you, 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 if you go back to step one on this series, you will be able to understand the 12 fundamentals on mental and emotional health. And uh, the journey into mental health begins with a commitment to come out of the hope source into reality. A lot of people are not, you know, they, 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 they don't differentiate from the reality of life or the reality of their situations. They left it to chance. You don't have to. And the part of mental practices is uh, we've talked about uh, keeping a journal, as you can understand. I think in a uh, part two series of this, we talked about uh, keeping journals. And in keeping journals, that helps you actually to, on daily basis, you understand what you are telling yourself. By capturing a thought, you know, today I've mostly been thinking, you try to capture what you're thinking. And this is because, um, this is as a result of, you talk about what that exactly is. And then you talk about the belief. This is because I have been telling myself. And when you talk about what you're telling yourself, and then you go to the next stage where, and what is God saying about this? And the moment you get to understand what your heavenly father is saying about that situation, then you're left with the challenge or the question of what do I do about it? Are you going to agree with God? Are you going to continue to allow your uh, uh, emotion to sabotage your happiness? You, are, you allow those uh, uh, stinking thoughts to continue to rob you of the quality life. We can live happy life every day. So the taking those journals are very, very vital for you to understand what you are telling yourself on daily basis. Now, a person's mental and emotional health can be gauged by how readily they take offense, by how easily they are hurt by others' actions. If you're someone that exposes yourself to what people are saying or what people are talking, what people are telling you, and that leads to taking offense when offense sometimes are not even intended. That is, I know, exposing how mentally and emotional healthy you are. So it is important. I have developed a live uh, toolbox that we take people through uh, gaining, uh, uh, gaining through mental and emotional health. It is as an aspect that is lacking in the church. We know that. But um, I do do consults on one-on-one. -on -one. I do walk people through. And um, perhaps some of us here probably might need to take a step further to do one-on-one -on -one consults in order to deal with what, because we've just been talking generally here, but uh, to some of us, this could come down to a specific area, something you have struggled most of your life, something you've been through most of your lives that hasn't really been dealt with. And it has to. And you know that no amount of uh, uh, pleading the blood of Jesus will do that. What is gonna set you free is truth. When you understand the truth, that just flip the coin over for your life. So steps number nine talks about prayer and the faith insights. This is very, very important because prayer have a different meaning from what you and I have known to be prayer. To many, prayer is like a shopping list. 
prayer is pretty much like a one-way traffic of us telling God, you know, talk to God and ask God, ask, 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 kind of a thing. You know, and unfortunately, there are people that pray, understand prayer as an, you know, pray like an orphan. Uh, Padre Bruce have uh, done a series on, with us here on, you know, postures in prayer. And if he ask directly, what is your posture? You know, the, whatever posture you adopt, that actually shows who you are. You know, we, we change postures whenever we meet different type of people in our life. When you meet a policeman, your posture changes. When you meet a doctor, your posture changes. When you meet a pastor, your posture change, you know. In the same way, what is your posture when you meet your heavenly father? There are people who understand God to, you know, as and who understand themselves, their relationship with God as an orphan. Can you imagine if all you see about yourself is an orphan? Can you imagine what your posture will be when you're standing or approaching your heavenly father? What are you gonna say? You know, some approach him as a servant. Others approaches him as a slave. But prayer is a father-son relationship. And when you understand yourself as a son, prayer changes form, prayer changes meaning. Prayer is no more just a asking. It becomes a quality time spending with your heavenly father. And through that quality time, we are solving issues. We are solving issues in our personal lives, but we are also solving issues in uh, in the society, we become a part of his workmanship. That's exactly what the scripture say. He say we are his workmanship. So prayer changes meaning. Prayer right now is not just a, a name it, grab it kind of a thing, name it, claim it thing. No, 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 no. Prayer is no more just God bless me, bless my wife and children, bless my grandkids. You know, God bless this food. No, no, you go past that. It becomes uh, a relation or something that we are constant on daily basis. It's no more something we do. Prayer is no more just what we say, but prayer becomes like the air we breathe. Okay. It is that. It's under, in prayer, you begin to understand that that is for you and is not against you. And uh, you also know that we are growing in his presence. Amazing. We are safe and secure, no matter what is happening around the world. Okay? Prayer also means assessing your inheritance as a son. We are not just, um, you know, we are not just accident, his accidents that happen out there. We are God's children. And as God's children, we have an inheritance. And uh, through this relationship period, we, we are mastering. We begin to understand. We begin to access. We begin to utilize what truly belongs to us. Step number 10 talks about church support, uh, community support through church. Now, it means that you belong to God's family. You belong to God's family. You are not just an island of your own. You are acceptable and you are loved. Okay? You are not judged. You are not shamed in any way. Religion judges and shame us, but the family of God does not do that. The kingdom family is amazing. Now, we have been through step 10, and this is the last run on the ladder. And uh, what that talks about is when we climb out of this, we stand in position to help others. You know what? This actually is what we are made for. This is what we are created. This is why we existed. We are made, our lives are to be a blessing to people. But you know what? 
these internal pains and the what we've been going through in life have so make us to be self-focused that we are forgetting the big picture of us being God's answer to the world that we live in. We are called to reconcile men to God. That is our calling. That is our mission. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 18 to 21, this is our calling. This is who we are. God wants each and every one of us for our test to become testimonies. What we've been through in life become catalyst in freeing others. And this is the goal for each and every one of us. And that is why things has to turn around for us. If you look at that wheel, uh, learning wheel on the, the Kairos uh, moment, Kairos circle, you find out that the, it goes round and instead of going on the same line, it actually shoots up. And in between, we now become disciples. We become uh, ambassadors of God, ambassadors of the kingdom of God ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we are now helping others go through life themselves. In summarizing, there are three points I want us to consider in this. Number one, I'm asking, have you been able to better understand and identify internal pain since taking this discipleship course? Have you learned something? Have you come to understand? Have you come to identify some of these issues in your own lives? Number two, what tools do you feel you have learned about that can better help you identify as well as deal with eternal pain? Have you understand any? Have you come across any tool that has become beneficial to you? This is important. And the last question, what do you feel your next step is in this journey? It is a journey. As I said, some of us here, this, I mean, I, I really thank God because my prayer all through this uh, four, four part of this series on internal pain is that by this point, you, you've, you've, you're already delivered, you're already freed. You've, you've come to understand that, that, that the Lord has healed you totally. But there are those who could still be, you know, uh, needing help. And if you are one of those, we are here to help. All our implementers, God has positioned us to provide uh, answers and to help you whatever situation that you probably will be in or will be going through. And um, I want to thank you for going through this. As I said, we are available. We are ready to help you to deal with and to walk through any further that uh, area in your life that you require answer or you require help. Thank you. And thank you for uh, going through this. God bless you real good.